I'll just record this, so if you want to watch any of this, it's awesome to be here at Google Developer Festival, GDG Fresno, and uh, to talk to you about the Go programming language. And there's recently been some huge news in the Go community, and I tweeted this, and it's been my most popular tweet ever, and I'll just bring it up and show it to you. Um, but it is uh, this one right here. I've had 207 likes and 174 retweets. The creator of Node.js has abandoned Node in favor of Golang. That's pretty amazing, right? The guy who created Node said, all right, there's a better solution, and it's Go. And so uh, a couple of years ago, 2013, I was getting back into the coding game after my work duties had taken me into another direction. I did online ed for many years at State Center Community College District, helped get all of the college faculty in Central California, helped train them to teach online. I studied online education at UC San Diego, along with a bachelor's in econ and a master's in business from Fresno State. And, uh, but I got back into coding in 2013, and my initial foray into coding, I was hired by a State Center Community College District to teach accounting. And I taught that for a year, and then they said, you're really good with computers. Do you want to start teaching some computer stuff? So I started teaching introduction to computers, computer concepts, and then just some basic HTML and Cold Fusion, hooking it up to an access database. But Cold Fusion is a markup language, and I got to choose which server-side language. And I thought, well, Cold Fusion will be easier for the students. They know HTML, it's markup, Cold Fusion's markup. And so I chose that over PHP. So at one point in my life, I made the wrong choice. <laughs> I taught Cold Fusion and HTML for a couple of years. And then in 13, after doing all the online ed, I had to make that choice again. And I looked to see what's the server-side language that people use. I looked at different options that are out there, right? ASP, PHP, those are kind of old school. And, uh, and then I uh, also looked at what was newer, which is Ruby uh, or Node or Python, you know, which one of those. And then I heard about Go. And in March of 2012, um, you know, Google released uh, the Go programming language, March of 2012. And Google, and I'm just going to bring up a little slide deck, which I didn't have launched here. And uh, I presented this recently up in Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley Code Camp. But Google, um, Google in 2006, right, something really interesting happened in computers in 2006. So 2005, 2006, Intel released the first commercially available dual core processor. So up till that time in history, I think of that as a mo monumental time in history. Because up until that point in history, all machines, all computers had been single core. And so all programming languages up until 2005, 2006 have been built for single, built on the idea that machines have a single core. And uh, there had been no programming language that had been built to natively, natively with mechanical sympathy. And so here's an idea, which is a new idea in computer science, mechanical sympathy, or it's one that not a lot of people know about. Mechanical sympathy, right? The language has sympathy with the mechanics, with the machine. So depending upon the machine, the language can optimize and take advantage of that machine. So prior to 2005, 2006, no major programming language had been built to natively take advantage of multiple cores. Not Java, not C, not Python, not JavaScript, not C Sharp, not C++. There were no languages out there. And Google, which is to me the best software engineering firm to have ever existed in the history of humanity, they are like amazing, <laughs> right? They looked at all the programming languages that were out there and they said none of them are meeting our needs. And in particular, what they were looking for is they were looking for efficient compilation, efficient execution, and ease of programming. And I like to just pause and kind of take a breath when I say that. Ease of programming. And at that point in time, you could have any two of those three. And Brad Fitzpatrick came up with this met metrics, two, two slides, which kind of uh, represent that. But if you want fast and efficient for computers, you could get C and C++, but that's not so fast fun for humans. <laughs> if you want fast and fun for humans, you could go Ruby, Python, Perl, maybe JS a little bit, but that's not so fast efficient for computers. And so Google wanted to create a programming language which really hit that sweet spot, fast for humans and fun for humans and fast for computers. And then also for concurrency, if you wanted to run concurrency, you could go with C, C++, and Java, Right? Like those could do concurrency well, but beautiful, straightforward code, not so much. 
right? And, uh, and then Go also hits that sweet spot. So they're really looking to bring together those three things right there. And up until they built this language, you could have two of those three, pick whichever two you want, and you couldn't have all three. And so to build this language, they hired some of the, the heaviest hitters in computer science. I call them luminaries of computer science. And so to receive that designation, luminary in computer science, what might you have to have done, right? Like, that's a pretty heavy distinction to lay on somebody. You're a luminary in computer science. You're one of the, the, the light posts. When we look over the history of computer science, you're one of the bright, shining lights. What might you have had to have done? Maybe invent the C programming language or help invent the C programming language. That'd be huge. Maybe help invent the Unix programming language. Unix, man, best operating system ever. Linux came out of that. That would be huge if you helped invent Unix. Maybe help invent the UTF-8, world's largest, most popular encoding scheme. Oh, yeah, maybe if you did that, that'd be huge. Well, they got the guys who did that. Ken Thompson, the B programming language, C programming language, Unix, UTF-8. Rob Pike, Unix, UTF-8. And then Robert Gressmer did Java stuff and a few other engineers at Google, they got those, those people together in 2006, and they said, let's build a new programming language. They worked on it, and then they open sourced it and released it open source in 2009, and then it went stable, version one, March of 2012. Well, 2013, I started teaching myself how to code, literally, for like the first time, like cold fusion's not coding. I didn't know arrays, I didn't know data structures, right? And so I started to teach myself the code, staying up late, watching classes. And, uh, and then I heard about the Go programming language. It's like, I want to teach the Go programming language. So now I've taught it many semesters out at Fresno State, many semesters at Fresno City College, and a ton of people online. And, uh, and now it's the world's, it's America's highest paying programming language. And the creator of Node has left Node for Go. So I feel happy that I made the right choice this time. And I'm confident that I could say it's the right choice. And here's some of what you could do with it. So all of Greater Commons, and I know you don't get to see the server, the back-end code or anything, but this is all running on Go. And who else is running on Go, right? So who else is running on Go? Let's take a look at that. Uh, well, Google, a lot of their stuff is running on Go. YouTube is Go. Apple does Go stuff. Dropbox. All these people. And then you ready? I'm just going to hit you fast here. Docker is all Go. Economist is, and New York Times, deeply embedded in Go. Getty Images, right? It's just like everybody is Go, and we could just keep going. Right, the, uh, the things just keep going. So, Go is a great choice for a language. Let me introduce you to language. You just want to see some coding instead of talking? Yeah, cool. So uh, we'll just take a look first at like uh, some you know basic stuff that you can do, and uh, we'll we'll look at you know declaring a variable, and we'll just see some of the syntax, and we'll look at creating some uh, aggregate composite data structures, whatever you want to call it, and how do we bring together multiple data types into one data type, and uh, and we'll bring it all the way up to interfaces and polymorphism, just so you can get a flavor of the syntax. Not bad for only having coded since 2013, right? <laughs> being able to spit out all those terms. And so the first thing is just variable declaration, and it's a static language, and, and I, will, I will throw in this just so you have a little bit of a sense of what is the language. So it's static, right? There's ease of compilation, all that. Performant, multiple cores, concurrency, compiled network, clean syntax, powerful standard library, garbage collected, right? And I don't know if static was in there, but it's a static programming language, so type matters. This is the short declaration operator, so you could declare a value of a certain type and assign it to a variable all in one kabang and uh, we'll go with 42 and we could see when I do that right that I've declared and assigned the value 42 uh, to that and that value is and if I format print that so it's a C family language so a lot of things if you know C uh, are similar if I just format that a new line escape character there percent T it's an int new line escape character there uh, and there's the int, right? So the type is int. So type is really important, and the compiler will check that. And the uh, compiler is your friend. So that's the first thing, just kind of seeing, you know, hey, that's how we use the short declaration operator. And next thing we're going to take a look at is, like, maybe I want to create, and it's all about type. 
So when I started working with Go, everybody's like, it's all about type. It's all about type. And when I say everybody, I mean like um, uh, nobody. <laughs> like I was learning Go from a book written in Chinese and translated to English at first because Go is really popular in China because it's uh, um, a lot of people in China. So I want to create my own type. This is type person. And it's like type string, type int, type bool. We now have type person. And uh, the underlying type will be a struct. It's a data structure. It's going to bring some stuff together. And so I could have first name, which will hold a value of type string, and I'll have last name, which will hold a value of type string. And then I could come down here and I could create a person. So I'll say person1 and short declaration operator. And then we're going to use a, a convention go called a composite literal. Composite literal. So uh, we'll have the data, data type, and then we'll have the curly braces, and then we'll have values. And so if we wanted to create a composite literal for an array of values, like a slice of int, right, I would have a slice of int, and, and here's the value, and then here are the curly braces, and then I put the, the, there's the type, sorry, here's the type, it's a slice of int, it's a type slice of int, here are the curly braces, and I put the values inside here, right, and then I could print that out, let me just get rid of this, xi. 42, 43, 44, okay? So composite literal, we have the type, we have curly braces, and then inside we have the values. Now I'm gonna create type person. So P1 colon equals, and it's gonna be, there's the type, the curly braces, now I put the values in here. Sweet, and uh, print that out, and I get Miss Money Penny, and if I wanted to, I could access each of the fields in there. I could do P first, and I could also do P last. Okay, and uh, and then let's say I want to create a type secret agent, and so uh, secret agent, the underlying type is a struct, and so this is a new type. And if I actually look, let's just trip out on this for a second. If I actually look at what is the type of that, percent %t missing the value, right? Percent %t it's missing what the value is. It's a type person from package main. And it's a lowercase p. And in, in Go, instead of uh, having to say public, private, as we create packages to organize our code, it just depends upon whether or not this is uppercase or lowercase. So they want clean, readable syntax, less typing for the developer. So lowercase means that this is uh, internal to a package. We don't say public, private in Go. There's a language with which we talk about the language. And, um, and they're re-envisioning how programming should be done. And so some terminology comes with a lot of baggage. And, uh, and so they say, we don't, we don't use public-private. We talk visible, not visible, exported, not exported. So it's visible outside the package, or it's exported outside the package, that kind of a deal. So that's, uh, that's how we would see the type. Now I'm going to create a secret agent. Anybody remember Miss Moneypenny? You know who, who, what storyline she's in? James Bond. James Bond, right. And so now uh, a secret agent will be everything that a person is. So I'm going to embed type person in type secret agent. So that's like, you know, maybe the equivalence of inheritance in uh, OOP. And then I'm going to add one more field here, and it'll be a license to kill, right? So secret agent could have the license to kill revoked, but we could say whether it's active or not. And then I'll create a secret agent. And uh, when I create a secret agent, I'm going to use that composite literal. And, uh, and so I have the type, and then I have the curly braces, and then inside I'm going to put in the values. And so the first field is person. And it's going to be of type person, and I'm going to put in the values, and then we're going to have license to kill, and that'll be true. And then for person here, I'm going to come in and populate that, and that person is going to be first, James, and last, Juan. And you have to have trailing commas, and then I'll just kind of bring all this up. And we'll do SA1. In Fresno, SA actually has some meaning. <laughs> right? S.A. Isn't that like brother in Spanish or something? Like, what's up, my, my friend? What's up, S.A.? James Bond, true, right? And we could add in license to kill here if we wanted. And we had something occur there. You'll see that we had some intertype promotion. And so, and we'll just see that license to kill is true. 
And that inner tight promotion is all the stuff here, all the fields there, when it doesn't conflict with fields you know, at the higher level in whatever it got embedded in, then all those fields get promoted. So I don't have to drill down. If I wanted to, I could drill down. Right? And by drilling down, I could say, hey, this is from secret agent one. It's type person. It's field first. Right? So I could be real specific if I did have conflicts in, in the fields. I could access the unique ones, and that's all going to run. So that printed out. And the next thing I could take a look at would be uh, creating uh, some methods and attaching methods to those types. And so to create a, a method, um, we do a function. And, uh, and the function signature in Go is func, and then it's going to have a receiver, and then it's going to have an identifier, and then it's going to have params. Okay, so you could have multiple ones, and then you could have returns, you could have multiple returns, and then you could have your code block. And so we're going to do func, and the receiver is what allows us to attach a, a function to a type, which makes it a method of that type. So any value of that type has access to that method. And notice the language I'm using to talk about the language. All right, so let's 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 create a receiver for type person, and person will be speak, and uh, we'll just have the person speak. And so we'll say front front line p first comma p last says hello everyone and uh, and then so that speak is now attached to any value of type person and we'll also create one for secret agent and we'll give it the same uh, identifier so that we could do something cool with interfaces and polymorphism in one second and so secret agent secret agent and uh, what's James Bond say? Shaken, not stirred. But it might not be. Yeah, well, he's the only one, so that's fine. All right. <clears throat> so now we have some uh, we have some methods, and let's use them. So we come down here, and uh, we'll say p1 dot speak, because uh, the value stored in variable p1 is of type person, so it's going to call the person one. And then we have sa1.speak, and the value stored in uh, the variable sa1 is of type secret agent, so we'll call the secret agent speak. And let's see if I made any errors. Uh, unexpected uh, hello, expecting comma, new line, and string. So uh, I kind of had that feeling. Uh, p first, p last, flumped print line says hello, everyone. And says shaken, not stirred. So I have double quotes in there. If I wanted to use double quotes in there, I could use a raw string literal, and backticks will escape everything inside the string. And I could then do this. Does that make sense? You always write the code with errors before you write the code without errors. Okay. Yeah, it's just like the Bible says, right? <laughs> or that amazing grace, I was blind, then I could see. Lost, then I was found. Miss Moneypenny says, hello, everyone. Came from P1 speak. And James Bond says, shaken, not stirred. Came from SA1 speak. And now, finally, for interfaces and polymorphism, poly, many, morph, change, what happens, we could create a type human. And type human is an interface. And uh, interfaces define functionality. My joke is an interface says, hey, baby, if you got these methods, then you're my type. <laughs> So values can be of more than one type. Values can be of more than one type. Wow. All right, a value can be of more than one type. And we could say here, any value that has the method speak is also going to be of type human. And so we could create a func foo, and we could say, you take in a human. And what do I want you to do when you do that? I want you to call speak. And so now with foo that takes in a human, Right? We could say foo, and we could pass in p1, because p1 is not only type person, it's also type human, because it implements that, since it has that method. And we could call foo secret agent1, pass in secret agent, because secret agent is not only of type a value of type secret agent, but also a value of type human, since it has that speak method. And so now when we run this, it'll run foo, which says, okay, let me call speak for that one. 
And before I, I do this, I think I'll just put a little thunk print line so we can see the output we're looking for beneath that. And so it called those methods. So that's just like a, a short introduction to the language and the syntax and composite data structures. And you saw a slice, which is what we use instead of an array. There are arrays, but arrays are more for the internals of the language. The slices are dynamic and shrink and grow as you need them. There are ways to optimize that, you know, so that you aren't, you know, using up too many resources. And uh, if you like what you're seeing, you could take this entire course at Greater Commons, learn how to code the Go programming language where I go through all that, and then also web development with Go. And this got one four-star rating because the person didn't like something about the website. <laughs> I kind of, as admin, want to go take that out, <laughs> but I'm not. Uh, so the course is actually a really good course, though it needs to be finished. Uh, there's a little bit at the end I need to do still with Google on that course. Um, so uh, the next thing maybe we could take a look at is web programming. Anybody have any questions up to this point? We're at 11.35, so 36. We're 21 minutes in. I think I get 45 minutes. So we've got 24 minutes left for web programming. Just give you a little bit of a view on that. Anybody have questions? You What's up? Format and then run. What's, what is that? Yeah, so your Go code is going to be written in a in a certain um, idiomatic style, and they've defined that the style has to be like this. Curly braces have to be at a certain place, not another place. You know, indents have to be. You know, I forget if it's four tabs or what, but that's what they are. And there's no more developer fights over your the curly brace goes here, there, the spaces are this, that. Everybody's code is the same because that allows teams to work better. And they made that decision at the high level. When you thump to your code, you're formatting it. It automatically formats it to uh, be that style. And um, so that's what the thump does. Yeah. And you could share all your code. Like here, this code that I just did right here, um, I could hit share and then I could grab this. And you know, I'll put this into the video that I'm recording right now when we're done. So if you want to play with that code, you can play with it. Kind of uh, what is the, the need for the uh, trailing commas? So trailing commas um, are just a good coding convention so that you don't forget to add one if you add more things. If you do, if you do just a horizontal uh, you know, um, definition or uh, initialization, then you don't need it. But uh, it's just good practice to always put your trailing comma. And they are required here. If I took that trailing comma out there, it's going to say, boom. Unexpected new line, right? So, hmm? Yeah. You mentioned that you're offering this as courses in both Fiddle State and Fiddle City. Are these part of a, a set structure agenda or are these just individual? Or the, the class itself? Yeah, no. So, uh, it got canceled in the spring. We didn't have enough students, and our budget doesn't allow us to run classes with less than 15 students. So, if you all want to come take this, um, it got canceled in the fall and spring, but if you're interested in this language and want to take it with me in person at City College, just call the dean. And you know, how many people would want to take it in the spring at City College? Let's just see a show of hands. One, two, three, four, five, um, six. So that's six people right there. And so you know. Yeah. Yeah, my plate's full, dude. Yeah, they, they, don't, they don't limit, and the fact that there are individuals here like myself who yeah. are just as new to the program as you were. Yeah, well, that's why we have Greater Commons, and yeah. you're going to get you know all that there. And when you have problems, very accessible, even to the point of like, let's meet at Starbucks if you're in town. <laughs> all right, cool. All right, so uh, any more questions? Well, let's look at web. Uh, Go for Actually, it. It's about your uh, Twitter post. Yeah. Um, what was the main reason the guy switched from uh, Node to Go? Because I'm actually I'm just barely starting to learn Node. And oh, good. So I'm kind of like looking at a crossroads before I go too deep into anything. Sure. Let's, uh, let's look at what he said. Well, it's right here. In a recent interview, Ryan Dahl, creator of Node.js, said the following quote when talking about Node's concurrency model. I think Node is not the best system to build a massive server web. I would use Go for that. And honestly, that's the reason why I left Node. It was the realization that, oh, actually, this is not the best server-side system ever. <laughs> that's pretty 
Yeah. But, but basing on, on the fact that it's been in existence for so long, because people have been doing those for as long as it has, for him to be able to change up like that, that's, he's being innovative. He's keeping his eyes open to something yeah. better than what he's been used to. Yeah. And then he knows this and he recognizes it, that that's a step up. Because when you can keep your eyes open to something new and go into a new field, even if you have to retrain from point A, you're doing way better because you're only setting yourself up for what the next levels are. Then. And if you're going to carry this behind you, the more you can take, the better off you are. So, yeah, drill by a standard is a much nicer happen. So, it's got to be, I don't know, I want to say centric, but it's like, again, it's been established. And of course, everybody likes to call back to established, but Go, as what that one pointed out, it has a lot more things on it. It's got an amazing standard library, an amazing team behind it. And it's uh, really well put together. It does concurrency super easily. So if we have time, I can show you a little concurrency. And how many more names are you going to get behind you than the one you showed me? Yeah. <laughs> that, that's something we cram for the cram right there. That, that's a long. Yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, to do a just quick web example, HTTP. And this is all covered in the web course. Listen and serve. And uh, I'm going to. Just do this on localhost 8080, and if you don't catch everything here, that's fine. It's all explained in that online course at Greater Commons. And, uh, and nil means I'm going to use the default serve mux. And so a serve mux is, uh, you know, when I first heard that term, I'm like, serve mux? The hell's a serve mux? Or a multiplexer? What the hell's a serve a multiplexer? You know, or a mux? It's like all you, it's just like another word for server, multiplexer, serve mux. And uh, you can create your own. You can go get a third-party package. There's a lot of third-party package out there. In particular, oh, Julian wow. Schmidt has a really awesome router. But we're going to use the built-in one out of standard library, which is awesome. And uh, HP listen and serve. And we'll do HP handle funk. And, uh, and then we're going to give it a pattern. So at all routes, we're just going to say run index. right? And so then we'll come down here. And we have to give it a function of a certain identifier and uh, a certain signature, and that signature is going to be, we need a response writer, so HTTP response writer, and we need uh, a request, a pointer to an, uh, uh, a request. And so when we have that signature, right, that implements what handle funk wants, and handle funk is looking for a function with that signature, a response writer and a pointer to request. We do do pointers in Go, where we're not passing the value, just passing the address, and then, okay, that's for a variety of reasons, something we might want to do in one situation or another. And then we could use from package IO, we could do IO writer. Oh, no, I want IO write string. And uh, we're going to write this to our response. And what we're going to just write is hello, GDG Fresno, my hometown, Q Bruce Springsteen. And then that's it. We're ready to do this, and it's going to serve that for us. So I just need to navigate, launch my terminal. And navigate to where I'm at, and uh, to do that, I got to remember where I'm at, and uh, and that is cd go source GitHub goes to eleven is my username on GitHub, and this shows you a little bit about namespacing and uh, package management. But everything gets namespaced. Go is your workspace inside Go. Inside Go, you're going to have three three folders. And those three folders are bin, package, and source. Bin will be where your binary files, when you compile, it compiles down to binary, runs in binary. You don't need a server. It is a server. You upload that binary somewhere and it runs. And you could cross-compile. I'm working on Mac. I need to deploy to Linux, cross-compile that for this Linux architecture, builds it for that Linux architecture. I SSH, upload it to AWS, and I'm, I've got my code server running. Linux as binary, low level, no intermediary, translating, interpreting going on right there on the machine. So uh, I'm going to go into my source. You need those three folders in your, your workspace. I'm going to CD into my source, and then I'm going to go into uh, 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 goes to 11, which is oh, GitHub, and then into GitHub, and then into goes to 11. And that's how we namespace, right? Everything's under its own domain. And then inside here, I have a CD into uh, which one am I in? I am in uh, uh, Ghost 11 Golang Web Dev. So I'm going to go into Golang Web Dev, and then I'm in 000, and I am in uh, 56 and uh, 01B. Go run me. That is an art in and of itself. Do you want to allow this to run? I do. Localhost 8080, hello GDG Fresno. <laughs> right? 
Sweet. So let's uh, keep rolling with our example. So that's the first example. I'm going to copy this and I'm going to bring it down and I'm going to do 2D. And I just presented this at Silicon Valley Code Camp a couple of weeks ago. And the next thing I want to do is break things into templates. And so to do things in a template, so I'm just checking to see what my steps are there. To, to use templates, a template is like a, a letter. <clears throat> you know, mail merge letter where I want this to be customized. This letter is going to be customized. If it goes out to Matthew, Matthew Higley. If it goes out to John Doe, John Doe. <laughs> I don't know anybody else in the room. I quickly looked around. I was like, ah. And, uh, and so we do that with our web pages where each web page is personalized for each user. And so we create that template. And to do a template, I'm going to have to do a var TPL is of type from package template type template. It's a pointer to a template. So I'm declaring that there's going to be a variable of this type. And uh, I need to import that package. Why is that not coming in? var tpl unresolved type pointer to a template. Let's see if it comes in in a second. Then we're going to use uh, an init function which sets our program up. It initializes. When your code runs the first time, it goes and does some work, gets everything ready to run. This is when the init function runs. Runs once, sets the program up to be deployed. Variable TPL, we are going to store in that from package template. We're going to say, hey, you must, and then, okay, cool, it brought it in. You must uh, template from package template, parse this glob, and the glob that we're going to parse it from is going to be from, uh, from, let me just look at this, let me think about the syntax there for a second. I need to create a folder template, templates, and so from folder templates, I want to do anything with the extension GoHTML. GoHTML is the convention for a file uh, that's a template, so I could just come in here and create a new file. And I'm going to give that file the extension. I could say this is index.goHTML. I'm going to give it the extension GoHTML. Uh, it could be anything you want. You could call it PHP if you wanted, just for fun, to confuse people who hack into your code. <laughs> if they get that far. And then inside here, I can start to do my template. And so uh, I could just come in here and I could say h1, hello, Fresno, GDG. And, uh, and then over here, I need to, uh, instead of IO write string, I'm going to do tpl.execute template. And so execute template, I'm going to execute that. I'm going to pass it to the, the response writer. And the ten template name is index.goHTML. And I'm not going to pass any data in. And if we look at the signature on that, it wants a writer, wants the name of the template to execute, and then any data. And so we're not going to pass any data in there. And I no longer need I.O. up there, so I'm going to remove that. So I think that's going to be pretty good. And I'm just going to compare this to my previous code. And so here I just have templates uh, forward slash star and, uh, and that also works. But you could do star.goHTML. So we'll see it that way since I coded it out this way this time. And uh, we'll control C and then CD up a level and then into 0 2 D and go run main and allow and then refresh. Hello Fresno GDG. So we're H1 now. Cool. Hi. And uh, you missed the good stuff, man. But you can watch it online. I'll give you the link afterwards. All right. And now we're going to you know, look at how do we start to modularize our temp templates. And so I have 0, 3D down here. And I have this one template. I could also create, you know, uh, like let's say I have a header that I use across the entire site. And I don't want to have to put that into each of my templates every time. So I could, I could do this as an include, and I could call this header and go HTML. And then here I could define a template. So I could define header in the definition of that. And uh, I'm going to grab this header. And now I could have a bit of an issue here. If I need to include CSS specific to each page. Then I need to think about passing in which CSS file. And I could pass that in as data, right? Um, that could be a bit of a, a hassle. I'm going to include everything right to here. Right, and you could do it however you want, whatever makes sense. And then I'm just going to say template header is what gets used there. And so I'm just going to put that there, right? So this is what header is, and that's where it goes. And if I wanted to, I could grab this 
and I could create a new template. Include footer go HTML cancel. Why didn't that work? Go THML HTML. And for that footer, I could define footer. Uh, programming is very humbling. It's um, uh, uh, amazed me a little bit and literally brought me to my knees at times uh, how hard it's been like at certain points to learn something and then just to continue to know it and use it it's humbling huh yeah and um yeah, thanks. Always good to get a little bit of therapy. All right, cool. Let's see 03D run. <laughs> CD 03D. Go run main. So we're going to see the same result here. I'll just launch a new window. But it was bringing it in modular, modularized fashion. All right, what's the next step? So we've got the templates part. Now I want to create a new page. Okay. So we'll take 03D and 04D. And I'm going to create another route. And so the another, next route I'm going to have is going to be about. About. And so now this is going to catch about. So let's go do that. So we're there at that, and we could also do the route about. And localhost 8080. We got about going to about, and I didn't change it here. I need to call about, not index. So it called the same page, same template. So now we're at about localhost 8080 forward slash about. And there's nuances here, right? This is going to go back to index because that trailing slash here, I didn't specify that in here, but if I said anything down route ends up at about, if it doesn't specifically find something, if I add that little trailing slash there, then, let me restart that, this will go back to about. So now that trailing slash catches anything down the line. And, uh, and then finally, two more, 4D, it's going to be 5D. What are we doing on this one? On 5D, we have about, we're going to pass in a more complex data structure. And so for a more complex data structure, let's say I want to pass in some data here. And on this one, I might pass in the variable 42, okay? The value 42. And so on index, here's how I would access that data. current data, like in Unix, like, hey, the current directory, current piece of data, when you pass data in, you got to know where your data structure's at, keep track of it, and then the current piece will be given to you. So here, if I wanted to pass in, just like on main here on about, maybe I want to pass in a slice of int. Just thinking if I want to pass in a slice of int. I guess so. current data, 
And I could also do range over that current data in, and when I range over that current data, Uh, well, almost got it. This is Emmet, so I'm combining some stuff here. There we go. And if I range over that current data, then what becomes the new dot is that current piece of data. And, uh, and now I'm going to print out those numbers vertically, if all works well. And uh, this is uh, 5D. Yep, cool. So there's 42. And about 42, 43, 44. I don't know why that came out three times each one. So we ranged over this and then UL 42, 43, 44. It's not quite what I was, what I was expecting. Range over that slice, print my data, range over the data, let's see what happens when we take that out. Shouldn't change anything, but just curious. Same. Let's put that back in. That's an odd noise. We have a water feature suddenly. Oh, because each time the current piece of data. That was odd. Speak up if you see my flaws. Right? So it, we just need to print that. And then what we need here is we don't need our ULs each time. We need those on the outside. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I'm just testing all y'all. I knew what I was doing. I just want to see if you're paying attention. And so that's, that's going to make sense now. There we go. Huh? Oh, no, no, no. I don't have stables. My car could use washing, though. <laughs> and, uh, and then here's an example of, uh, like, you know, here we create customer data struct, title, and then members with strings. And then the title is about our team. And members, a slice of strings. And then we could pass in that customer data, and we could start doing things with that in there. And uh, you could actually access fields. So I'll just copy this quickly since we're running out of time and drop this into ours here. And we'll pass in CD, right? And so now when we come back to the about template, that's going to print out our entire data structure. And if we wanted to, we could, we could access those fields. We're passing in CD and the fields have title and members. So we could say, give me title and give me members. And we could even take title and we could put it up here. And, uh, and then down here we could range over members and we could print out our members. All right, so we're accessing things by their fields because of the data structure that we passed in. So we created type, custom data, it's an underlying type of struct, it has two fields, title and members, it's type string, type slice of string. Uh, we create a value of uh, uh, we create a we create a value of type customer data using composite literal where we have the type and then we have the curly braces and we have our fields right. So when we pass in this value of type custom data, right, we've got those fields which we can access. So let's take a look at that now. And the last thing to show you is uh, how do we get uh, files to serve. And uh, to that, you have to use a line of code which takes more time to explain than I have here. But we're basically saying anything from the assets folder, we're going to strip off assets and we're going to create a file server so we're serving everything in that directory assets. And so what that allows us to do is start to include uh, some HTML and some CSS. And so here we have assets and we have index CSS and an image. And so if we look at our template for index, 
we're now saying get, get from folder assets this CSS, right? And when we look at that CSS, we're saying get from folder assets this image. And so when we run this, we get this. Which is where you will be if you start using the Go programming language because they have ease of execution, ease of compilation, and ease of programming. So check out Greater Commons if you want to learn more. And if you're interested in creating courses on Greater Commons, we're looking for teachers. And how, why are we different than lynda.com or Pluralsight or any other learning platform that's out there? It's because we have a really humanistic approach to teaching where we really emphasize teaching, not just presenting. <laughs> and I don't know if you've had the experience of watching some of these online trainings and you're like, man, this is awesome, right? Two and a half hours, understand and use Photoshop. And you watch the whole training and you're following along with the instructor and you and understand all of it and you get to the end of it and you know none of it, <laughs> right? And so not just presenting, we teach on Greater Commons which often means that I'm going to show you a concept, and I'm going to give you a hands-on exercise, and I'm going to give you the solution to that hands-on exercise. So you get to work it, you know, you've had three exposures to it, and that really helps you as a student learn it. And you're going to see me, the instructor, in all the videos. You're going to see all of our instructors in the videos, because that helps reinforce, as humans, we like seeing the person that we're communicating with or that's communicating with us. And we and, need to Yeah, and so we get a lot of lot of meaning and value out of actually seeing nonverbal communication, seeing the teacher. And so our platform really encourages, you know, requires that, having the teacher on screen and, uh, and not only teaching the skills and knowledge, but also at the end of a video, you know, you might say, okay, that's, so that's it for programming in this video. Now I want to tell you a story about my friend Joe that happened this weekend. <laughs> and you share personal anecdotes. Again, just creating that human connection because you know, for those who just need the language, they can cut out the video at that point. But for those who appreciate a little bit more connection with the teacher, we go for that humanistic teaching, not the depersonalized voice over screen recording presenting. That's what we're about at Greater Commons. So if you've ever thought about creating a course and teaching people, it's a great way to help others and make extra income. That's the plug. Thank you all for coming. Anybody have questions?